everyone, I'm Fola. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Diversifying Research Podcast. This is a podcast where we amplify the voices of underrepresented individuals who are either involved in research themselves or engage other underrepresented groups in research. Over the course of this limited podcast series, we will critically consider how to improve the inclusion of underrepresented voices in research. During this episode, we're joined by Makinda Shahal, who works at Trade Sexual Health. And over the course of this episode, we're going to consider the engagement of the LGBT community in research. Makinda is going to speak about the leading roles charities can play in research, how charitable institutions can be key to supporting researchers in engaging the LGBT community, and differences between an individual's identity, behaviour and desire, and how an awareness of these differences can be helpful when carrying out research. Hello, Makinda. How are you? I'm great, thanks, Fala. How are you doing? Awesome. I'm fine, thank you. Could you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Of course. So my name is Makinda Chahal. I'm the Senior Health Promotion Worker and Intersectionality Lead at Trade Sexual Health, which is an LGB and T health and sexual health charity based in Leicester and working across Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Nice. So for those who don't know, although it's a very popular phrase, could you please explain what LGBT means? Of course. LGBT stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Communities and comprises of a variety of different sexual identities and gender identities. Nice. And you also mentioned that you're the intersectionality lead for trade sexual health. What is intersectionality? That's right. So intersectionality explores all of the minority identities that an individual has, those identities that intersect with one another. So say, for example, if we're looking at lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender identities being a minority, but then also looking at the other minority identities within that community. So say, for example, ethnicity, if somebody's from an Asian background or from the black community, it's understanding the dynamics of having those minority identities and how that can impact on an individual. And it would be good to get an understanding of what motivated you to work at Trade Sexual Health and specifically work on issues around intersectionality and LGBT? When I first entered into the voluntary sector back in 2012, I started as a sexual health outreach worker for an LGBT charity based in Derby. When I first started working there, it was very apparent of the lack of diversity within a specific sector of the voluntary sector. And as I got to meet more individuals from different organisations, it became even more apparent of that lack of diversity within the LGBT voluntary sector, and specifically within um, HIV prevention, which is the field that I currently work in. So that kind of like inspired me and spurred me on to kind of be part of that visibility within the sector. And I knew fully well the power of visibility from when I was at university, when I was part of the LGBT society. At the beginning of that time, there were no people of colour as part of the LGBT society at university. But over the time that I became part of the committee, that diversity really increased over the time. And that really showed me the power of visibility when working within organisations or groups. So I kind of took that mentality on and continued with that through the course of my time during the voluntary sector, which has kind of led me up to the role at Trade, where I started at Trade in 2014 as their sexual health outreach worker, specifically working with South Asian gay and bisexual men. That's really great to hear. Thank you. So I decided to get you on the podcast because I think the work you're doing at Trade is very interesting, especially because you have created a survey, especially to engage LGBT individuals who come from different backgrounds to get an understanding of their experiences during lockdown. Can you speak about some of those research activities you've undertaken? Of course, yeah. So with COVID-19 survey that we conducted with um, LGBT communities across Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, we've done this survey in order to see how we have to adapt services or create new services to address the needs of the local communities in the aftermath of the initial COVID-19 crisis within the UK. 
Some of the initial findings from that, one of the first things that we asked individuals was what their top three concerns were related to the COVID-19 crisis in the UK. But the first one being that the majority of people who responded to the survey has said that their one of their top concerns is unable to see friends and family, followed by the health of their friends and family, and then followed by their decrease in mental well-being. It's really evident to us that from these findings, social isolation and impact on mental health are going to be some of the key factors which shape some of our services going forwards. That's really insightful, and I can definitely relate to some of those findings. And I know you noted at the start that you're also involved in some HIV prevention work. How has that been affected by the whole pandemic? It's been really interesting, actually, because a lot of the activity around kind of like health care has really had the emphasis put onto uh, COVID-19 itself. However, We've still been not as busy as a service, but there has been still demand there for some of our services. So although we haven't been able to offer face-to-face services such as one-to-one practical support or even rapid HIV testing in person, one thing that we have been able to do is to be able to still distribute our safer sex packs, which we have distributed by post to individuals who are still having sex during this time, but also signposting to online sexually transmitted infection postal test kits and also HIV postal test kits where people can do the test kits and collect the samples themselves at home, post them off to the lab and then receive the results by text message. So it is a service which had been there before but has really kind of increased in capacity because either of the closure of local sexual health services completely or running on a very limited capacity because resources have been spread elsewhere through the healthcare system. It's great that you're able to still offer those services, but also it would be good to further understand the relation between LGBT charities and academia and how that specifically pertains to research. So within your role at Trade, can you speak about some of the ways that you have supported academic institutions and academics with their research and what some of those research topics have been? So research that we've actively either kind of like collaborated with academics on have mostly been around HIV prevention, interactions with gay and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men. We've also collaborated on some research specifically exploring chemsex, so the phenomena around gay and bisexual men and other men having sex with men using recreational drugs to facilitate sex and sexual activity. Then also research that we've been asked to participate in or share out amongst our community. The majority have been focused around the mental health and well-being of individuals, hate crime and the impact of hate crime on individuals. And also over the last few years, a large increase in the demand for participants, specifically around transgender identities and non-binary identities and the impacts on their mental health and well-being and accessibility to healthcare and other healthcare services. Wow, that's a really broad range of topics. And it's great to hear you speak about just how diverse those research topics are, because I guess with this podcast, we've mainly been focusing on health research. But there are some other important topics like hate crime, for instance, and identity issues. In terms of your relationship with researchers and the ways that you've supported them, What do you think has been some examples of best practice when researchers and institutions try and engage with you? There's been some really great practice and some really great opportunities that we've had with researchers. And I think one of the best practice things were where researchers were, if their topic of research was on LGBT identities of some form, that the researchers or the lead researchers themselves or even any research fellows were part of the LGBT community too. More often than not, there is a lot of research which is very, you know, targeted towards LGBT communities. And like I said earlier, specifically around trans and non-binary identities of late. But a lot of the time, if the researchers don't identify with that community, less people are willing to engage. And one thing that we have found is from transgender communities, is that they're often facing research fatigue, where there's so much research and research proposals and opportunities to partake in research come in their way, that actually it's just really tiring or could be really emotionally draining to go through the same types of responses over and over again. However, if it does come from 
somebody from within the community who has that understanding, then participants are more likely to come forward. And one example I can name is where trans identities have been the lead within research is a national piece of research exploring trans identities and non-binary identities being led by a trans peer group based in Yorkshire. And actually they've got a lot of trans individuals who are part of the uh, steering group for the research itself. So actually trans communities have had that input from the beginning as opposed to just being the afterthought. Definitely. And I guess there might be researchers or research fellows listening to this podcast but don't necessarily identify with the community but want to do some great work with LGBT individuals. What tips would you give them on how to go about it despite not identifying with the community? One of the first things is just to get some basic LGBT awareness training. So if there is any training which is offered by your institution or offered out there by LGBT charities themselves, then definitely taking the opportunity to kind of understand the ins and outs of individuals' identities, what some of the struggles are of LGBT individuals and, and hearing it from LGBT individuals outside of a research space and just taking up the opportunity and showing your willingness to want to learn about those communities before embarking on any research that individuals may want to do with those communities. Awesome. And would it be possible for you to just suggest certain sites or certain charities that offer great LGBT awareness training? Because I guess some people might not know where exactly to look. I mean, I can definitely recommend us at Trade. So we do offer <laughs> LGBT awareness training, so it's my plug here. Although we're in, based in Leicester and Leicestershire, I think over this coronavirus pandemic, we have started to run some training sessions online by different video platforms. So there definitely will be an opportunity to be able to offer that to individuals wherever they're based. But also, you know, we do work with partners in lots of different regions across the UK. And I can definitely um, recommend some organisations wherever in the UK you're based. I love the fact that you just plug yourself in there. That's awesome to see. You've got to in this day and age, haven't you? (laughs) (laughs) You definitely have to. And I imagine the training you do sort of includes a lot about intersectionality, which is very important, right? That's right. Yeah. So as well as understanding intersectionality itself and the impact of minority identities on individuals, one thing that we really break down is actually a lot of the time individuals can be very overwhelmed with lots of different identities and sexual identities in particular that individuals may use to identify themselves. However, as part of this training, we do break down the dimensions of sexual orientation into exploring an individual's identity, desire and behaviour and how they could be seen as standalone or interacting with one another to kind of represent sexual orientation as a whole identity. But exploring how those individual factors could also be very important into understanding that person's interactions with the wider community or the impacts of those different identities on their own health and well-being. Awesome. So from the work that you've done with researchers, do you think that there is sufficient understanding of intersectionality as it relates to the LGBT community? Difficult one to answer, but from my own experience, when I've looked at research, for example, which has targeted specific ethnic minorities on a specific healthcare issue, so say, for example, when research has been conducted with South Asian communities and the health impact on them with type 2 diabetes, because they're seen as a very high-risk group, more often than not, individuals or researchers look at the South Asian community as a homogenous group solely based on their ethnicity. However, when you apply the dynamic of intersectionality and start to explore the minorities within the minority, that could also highlight some key issues where specific work needs to be targeted. So say, for example, if it were to be identified that LGBT South Asian individuals we're more likely to acquire type 2 diabetes, not based on hereditary factors, but also on lifestyle factors, and then exploring the reasons behind those lifestyle factors, which could then be as a result of their mental health, then actually all of these little individual parts do have a greater impact. 
by exploring the individual intersectional identities within a wider identity could really highlight some things that probably would have never been explored before. Yeah, that's a really insightful point. And I think from my observations as well, there tends to be a recognition of the intersectionality between ethnicity and sexual orientation. But one thing that you're also really passionate about is thinking about aspects of faith and how understanding that can really inform research. Could you speak a bit more about that? Yeah, we embarked on a project back in 2016 with a local multi-faith charity called the St. Philip Centre. And this specific project was to explore sexuality, gender identity and individuals' belief and how the communities, a standalone community, so LGBT communities and faith communities, could work with one another to best support LGBT people of faith. Now, the aim of this research was ultimately first to recognise that LGB and T people of faith actually existed. And we kept that aim really simple solely because from the research that we had done beforehand, that there were lots of wider faith communities which were not wanting to admit that there were LGB and T people of their particular faith within their community, which we know is false. They probably are there, but not feeling comfortable to you know, be themselves. And we know that if you're prevented from being your authentic self, that will have an impact on your mental health and well-being going forward. In the end, we ended up creating a guidance document that faith communities or LGBT people of faith could use to approach their wider faith community to see what they could do as a wider faith community to support LGBT people of faith. But as part of that, we needed to get the input from everybody. So, wider faith communities, wider LGBT people of faith and no faith in order to kind of understand where those barriers were, as well as talking to faith community leaders who were not willing to come on the record for what they wanted to say about the support for LGBT communities or individuals solely because they feared backlash from the wider faith community. So we knew that actually that was a really important input that we needed from those faith community leaders as part of addressing the wider picture of how to support LGBT people of faith. So, you know, exploring just those intersectional identities based with their health and well-being impacts on those individuals played a really important factor in understanding how everybody could support all individuals going forwards. Yeah, and that's a really, really important point. It's been great that you've been able to speak about the best practice when it comes to engaging with researchers, but also the benefits of considering intersectionality. What would be good is for you to also give us a bit of advice on how you think researchers and universities can improve the way they approach charities, but also members of the LGBT community. In light of your comments about the fact that a lot of people within the trans community specifically are feeling a sense of research fatigue. Researchers often want a lot from organisations or they ask for a lot, you know, we'd want participants, we want to run a focus group with your service users, etc. But one thing that researchers could do is actually, as a suggestion, could be to utilise some of those skills to give back into the community. So there are a lot of, you know, small to medium-sized organizations or charities who don't necessarily have the capacity to run research as academic as researchers would from institutions. So one way that researchers could give back to the community is by volunteering some of their time or volunteering some of their resource or skill set to the communities to help them build up their own research to then further support the organizations running frontline services. I mean, we've been really keen advocates of research into action for a very long time. And so when researchers do approach us, we do always ask and explore how, once this research is complete, how can we then put it into practice and put it into action directly on the ground straight away. And obviously when we've had a lot more of an influence within that research, we can get a lot more of those actions started sooner rather than later. But that could be another consideration for researchers too, because all researchers want to have their research used in some way, shape or form. So if, you know, like I said, by volunteering that skill set, that could be a way of kind of applying that research directly into action or helping those organisations build up their own research in-house. Wow, that's really great. 
and also to tackle the issue of research fatigue as it relates to the trans community, what do you think can be done on a practical level? I think on a practical level, just getting trans communities involved from the beginning and getting their input into the way the research is going to be shaped by having a peer-led group which kind of leads on that research as lay people could really help kind of shape that research in a way that where trans people have understood where that fatigue comes from and starts trying to circumnavigate around that or putting in additional factors to support individuals with reliving maybe quite emotional or traumatic experiences over and over again now i know that as part of researchers you know as part of ethics they need to be able to provide or signpost to support for individuals if they have been triggered by what they've spoken about but sometimes researchers could take the extra step by understanding not just where people can signpost to but actually understanding and getting in contact with the organisations that researchers want to signpost participants to if needs be and actually understanding if they are the most appropriate services for them or if there's a more localised service which they may want to access to. So actually, instead of just writing down the signposting information, getting in contact with those organisations which the researchers want to signpost people to just to see if they are the right service. Those are really, really good suggestions. And earlier you spoke about differences between an individual's identity, behaviour and desire and how that relates to the LGBT community. Could you please elaborate on that? So when exploring and understanding the dimensions of sexual orientation, as I mentioned earlier, it's broken down into an individual's behaviour, an individual's desire and an individual's identity. When those three factors intersect with one another, that's where an individual can truly like be themselves, you know, identify with all of those factors. However, there would be individuals which may only fall into one or two of those different areas. It doesn't make their identity any less valid, but from a health perspective, it could be really important to understand that. And so one example when we work with individuals within sexual health and HIV prevention is this term where we use men who have sex with men. Now, the term men who have sex with men isn't an actual identity in itself. It's a description of a type of behaviour. In the sense of sexual health and HIV prevention, the type of behaviour would be same-sex sex. In the example of a man having sex with another man, They may not necessarily identify as gay or bisexual. They might identify as heterosexual, but actually their behaviour is that of same-sex behaviour. But also they may only desire to be with other men. We're using the example of a gay man, but not necessarily have the identity of a gay or bisexual man. So from a health perspective, if we're exploring the behaviour of individuals would be far more important than the actual identity of the individual itself because the behaviour could have more of an impact on that person's health and well-being than their actual identity itself. And you've sort of touched on it in the descriptions you just gave, but what do you think are some of the other benefits for researchers and research output if there is an awareness of the differences between identity, behaviour and desire? I think by being aware of those specific areas and specific topics can really help researchers tailor the responses or the way, you know, researchers ask questions or frame the way that they want to do the research based around those different topics and not solely using the factor of identity to explore if we're looking at health behaviours in particular, not just solely focusing on identity because the behaviour of the individual could have a far bigger impact than their actual identity or label that they give themselves. Yeah, awesome. And I know as Trade, it is an LGBT organisation. Does it affect the extent of engagement you get from individuals because of those differences in identity, behaviour and desire and individuals might not necessarily identify as LGBT, although they're having sex with men. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's one thing that we've identified both as an organisation, but across the sector too, where if an organisation is very outwardly LGBT, you know, as an LGBT organisation, that 
in itself could act as a barrier for those individuals who don't identify within the LGBT spectrum. And so actually what we then do is as an organization, we go out into the spaces where we know we will find men who have sex with men and engage in health interventions within the spaces where we know that particular cohort of individuals will be. We would conduct outreach sessions in public sex environments and cruising grounds where we know that we would find an area where men are engaging in sex with other men without necessarily having the identifying label to dictate that particular space. And also likewise with outreach work, which we've done in men's saunas, so sex on premises venues. Once again, we know that's a space where we would have men having sex with other men and taking away that label identity, but by us entering into that space allows them to access you know, the resource and the information that we have within a space that they feel more comfortable with. So we've always been really keen advocates on, you know, taking our services out into the community or out where the need is the greatest. Great. It's really good to see that you're very proactive in sort of promoting engagement. So we're coming towards the end of the episode. Is there anything you'd like to plug or you'd like to mention which we haven't covered? Just we're plugging really. So, you know, as an organisation, trade's been around for 20 years. And I think going forward, the shape of the HIV prevention and voluntary sector and LGBT voluntary sector will be dramatically changing in light of coronavirus. But, you know, there are still key services and great services support charities across the UK, which really benefit from the support of researchers to then, you know, provide the evidence to a much higher level. So say, for example, within local authorities and public health departments that can really shape our services going forward. So researchers do have that power, but also have the power to be able to support the individuals and organisations who are working on the ground to really, you know, push the HIV prevention and health promotion kind of communications forwards. So I'd urge all researchers to kind of, you know, reach out to those organisations because we need you the most right now. And, you know, organisations like Trade wouldn't, you know, we just need that support going forward. So, you know, we're based in Leicester, Leicester and Rutland, but there's lots of other organisations like us across the UK, which could benefit from your support. Yeah, awesome. And if they aren't able to come to Leicester to help, or if they want to help trade specifically, but live in London, for instance, can they help you remotely? Yep. So, I mean, if it comes to like sharing a skill set or, you know, remote research, then we'd be more than happy to you know have some conversations around that. But if you want to work in a specific area, then we'd always be happy to signpost to any of our partners within the areas where individuals may work or live to then do some localised research. But we'd be more than happy to engage in remote working too. So that's that's definitely an opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, Makinda. I've learned a lot about engaging the LGBT community in research and I'm sure our listeners have gained a lot as well from listening to you, Makinda. Please tune in to our next podcast episode where I'll be speaking to Sherelle Augustine on how she co-founded a charity to raise awareness of sickle cell disease and engaged health professionals and her local community.